is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. So where did you see news of the SCOTUS leak last night? Was it on Twitter? I know my feed blew up. On Wednesday, we'll talk about the leaked draft that indicates the Supreme Court has voted to overturn Roe v. Wade and how legislation awaiting Governor Lamont's signature will make Connecticut an abortion safe haven for women. That's tomorrow. Now, today we're focusing on Twitter. Now that the richest person in the world, Elon Musk, has agreed to a deal to buy Twitter for $44 billion, Musk tweeted that the social media platform is a digital town square, and he wants it to be a, quote, destination for wide-ranging discourse and disagreement. Joan Donovan, a disinformation researcher at Harvard, is one of many who say Musk's interpretation of free speech would likely worsen harassment on Twitter. Coming up where we live, we hear from Donovan about the future of Twitter under Musk and how will social media change direction after demands in recent years to moderate content. Evan Greer also joins us, director of Fight for the Future, a nonprofit digital rights organization. Now, we want to hear from you this hour. Do you use Twitter or have you already deleted the app? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Now, for more context on Elon Musk's Twitter deal, joining us now on Zoom is Georgia Wells, tech reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Georgia, welcome back to the show. Hi, Lucy. Thanks for having me. So I got to ask, what was your initial reaction when it was announced that Elon Musk wanted to buy Twitter? I was kind of in shock. I I didn't quite know what to think or whether to take it totally seriously. Elon Musk, you know, obviously billionaire, founder of many companies, gets a lot done. But he also, his Twitter feed is full of random stuff. Like he makes marijuana jokes. Like, So I didn't know whether this was just an idea from him in the beginning or whether he was serious. But as the days and weeks drew on, it became pretty serious. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal reporting from you and your team, he's been buying up shares since January, but it became public in April. Uh, Elon Musk, he's got 82 million followers and and counting. And you mentioned, you know, in the past how he has used the platform. So let's talk a little bit about what we think about his track record on Twitter. And, you know, why would shareholders agree to sell to him? Well, so like, at a certain point with these types of deals, it's a lot more about just like how much money he's offering than than Elon Musk, the person. And so in this case, he's offering more money than the shares are currently trading at. So that kind of makes it hard for the board to, or if the board were to try not to go forward, they'd be under pressure to make a pretty compelling argument for how they viewed they could get their shares to that price. But in terms of like what this might mean for the platform, it's his use of Twitter is really wild. Like it, it's hard to anticipate what he wants to see. But he said that he wants more free speech, kind of unfettered or um, kind of within the bounds of the law. You mentioned his uh, the use of Twitter from Elon Musk has been wild. So can you give us some broad strokes? What has he said in the past and you know how you've seen his use of the platform evolving since I think since 2010? Yes, 2010, he joins Twitter. Like his first tweets are just to announce his platform. Then like he doesn't tweet for a long time. 18 months later, he tweets, went to Iceland on Saturday to ride bumper cars on ice. So, so you can see at this point, it's really quite anodyne. Um, but by 2015, it, Twitter has become this like really daily habit for Elon. He posts like often like in the middle of the day, even when like Tesla was just like kind of putting out fires left and right. And like he'd sometimes like reply to major figures like uh, Jeff Bezos um and then like twitter just kind of like became excuse me more and more of a habit from there for him so uh, and it gets also more wild during this time and lands him in legal trouble occasionally so people might remember there was a tweet he posted kind of suggesting a british cave explorer was a pedophile there was another tweet saying he was considering taking tesla private and that he had secured the funding to do so and both of these kind of landed him in trouble. And my colleagues reported that he had a public relations consultant during this time to kind of who urged him to lower his profile on Twitter, kind of the idea that like this is more trouble than it's worth for you. 
And in an email to this consultant, he says, we'll tweet as I wish and suffer the consequences. So it goes. So this is that message from him has really been like informing how I've been looking at what he's been tweeting lately. It sounds like he um, is really interested in Twitter. He has a lot of ideas and he'll suffer the consequences or not. Because he's the richest person in the world. What are the consequences for Elon Musk, right? <laughs> exactly. I understand over the weekend he was tweeting about bashing antidepressants. Uh, so this is, again, offering commentary on many topics. He's got a lot of haters, but there's also quite a big, bit of a fan base. Yeah, like Elon's fan base is kind of a, a double-edged sword. Like clearly it... um you know, he, he draws a tremendous amount of power with all of these followers. He, like he really knows um, the type of engage, the type of content that gets people engaged and, and how to kind of interact on Twitter. But there have also been times where he tweets about people and then his fans it will go after them. And so last week we saw him tweeting about the, the top lawyer at Twitter, this woman, Vigia Gade, and then her mentions on Twitter are just absolutely filled up with racist and sexist messages from his fans and from people who really you know, look up to Elon. So, so he has a tremendous amount of power on Twitter. And, and at times it, it appears to be used um, in ways that make life really rough for other people. And that woman you mentioned, the top lawyer, uh, he I think heading up a lot of the content moderation that people were demanding, especially after um, the January 6th uh, insurrection, uh, you know, who should have accounts. And when we think about Elon Musk's uh, opinions on, on free speech, I mean, this is the concern of what will be rolled back uh, in uh, Elon Musk's uh, Twitter world, Georgia. Yeah, exactly. So, so Twitter, you know, over the years, Twitter, like Twitter started off, um, many executives kind of really embracing kind of unfettered free speech or what they viewed as unfettered free speech. And then over time, the company kind of grew to see um, like aspects of that as like silencing other groups of people. And so Vigia Gade, she, she was um, in charge of the company of implementing and her team was coming up with many of these policies of, of how to kind of like you know, prioritize free speech while also kind of giving users ways to either like report harassment or um, also coming up with policies that would make certain types of like misinformation or hateful messages. Um, what's the word like like banned from the platform. And many employees at the company saw this as like a really important trajectory for the company. And when Elon tweeted, he tweeted this meme kind of making her the face in a way of many of the criticisms he had of the company. Employees saw this, or many employees saw this as like, like this was how he was going to kind of project his views on the, to the company. And this was how Elon was going to show that he doesn't support um, the company's policies and wants the company to change directions in a way that's like really freaked out many of the current employees. Again, you're hearing Georgia Wells here on Where We Live as we talk about this uh, deal between Twitter and Elon Musk uh, to purchase the social media platform. Uh, we've heard from listeners or even seen on our feeds people dropping Twitter or planning to do so. Kevin uh, sharing uh, with us uh, once the, the deal goes through, once Musk takes control of this account, this Twitter, uh, Kev's Kevin tweets, um, he's going to delete his account. If I wanted to hang out on 4chan, I'd go there. I do not want any goods or services associated with Musk. And so uh, what have uh, you been hearing in, in your reporting, uh, Georgia, with uh, the announcement of this deal last week? So it's it can be really hard to quit Twitter. Like, you know, as much pain as Twitter can cause some people in their lives, it's also there's not quite a, uh, an equivalent. Like it's, um, it's it has been instrumental in hearing about and helping people grow many social movements. So I'm just thinking about like Black Lives Matter or Me Too. Um, both of those movements, like the hashtag activism was a really important part of how they um, kind of reached so many people. And certainly if the company rolls back certain protections for users, I could imagine the experience for many users, um, you know, becoming a more kind of toxic place or what they view as toxic and some users leaving, but it's still, 
I think going to be hard if people want to remain a part of like the global kind of town square type conversation. Twitter is still the most obvious place that that happens. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. We'd love to hear from you about this Twitter deal. Are you going to quit Twitter? Have you already done so? Again, you can join us also on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You know, I'd mentioned uh, the SCOTUS leak at the top of the show, Georgia. And when I was on last night, I mean, you're seeing, it might be who I'm also following, but, you know, so many uh, journalists and uh, uh, policymakers uh, weighing in on, on the latest news. And so I'm, I'm interested if you can talk more about, you know, who is on Twitter these days. And when we think about, you know, Elon Musk's uh, aims uh, to uh, make this, as he mentions, the digital town square to expand users, you know, I'm just wondering what you've been hearing from the experts you've been talking to. Mm -hmm. I mean, Twitter, they've got about 80 million users in the US. So so I try to remind myself, it's not like, it's not everybody. um, but, But it is a really good chunk of the kind of hyper online people in the US and obviously like lots of journalists, lots of policy people, lots of lawmakers, government officials. Um, and internationally, I think the population tends to be pretty similar also, kind of the more hyper online community. Um, in ter- but in terms of where that could go, Elon has talked about wanting to roll, um, kind of prioritize what he views more as like unfettered free speech. So so rolling back many of the rules that Facebook has put in place over the years. And talking to Twitter employees about that, they said it can be a little bit tricky. Like it might not achieve some of the things he might want to achieve. So in the past, when Twitter had these more like unfettered, like really like um, kind of uh, far fewer rules on the platform, this is around like 2015, 2016, 2017, employees of the company began to fear that they were reaching a plateau in the U.S. at the number of users because the toxicity they viewed of the platform they believed was kind of deterring other users. So, so you know, as, as Elon talks about this idea he has of free speech, current employees are making the point that like that might not actually kind of expand the conversation to include all the different voices in the way um, you know some users might anticipate when they first hear him talk about it. When we think about the proposed changes uh, for Twitter, you know, from what Musk has indicated, can you give us more details in terms of, as we mentioned, a lot of the content moderation, but even, you know, now you can't edit tweets, but that might be something that could come down the line under uh, a Musk's uh, interpretation of what Twitter should be. Can you tell us more, Georgia? Yes, the edit button has been a really hot button issue for Twitter users. I find it to be a little bit of a head scratcher, but I mean, you know, a lot of the folks I know, if they need to edit a tweet, we'll just post a new one. But so this edit button for years, people have said, like, you know, what if what if I make a typo? Is there any way to, like, edit a tweet and and maybe it could stay edited on it? And um, oh, brain fart. I'm trying to remember. Another outlet has done really good reporting on what the edit, I think The Verge, what the edit button might look like. And their reporting has been showing that, like, yes, it could look something like you could edit your tweet. The tweet would, like, say it has been edited, but maybe there would be a log of all the different changes. But the reason this edit button idea has been a total headache for Twitter has been the potential for it to be abused. Because the history of Twitter has been anything that can be abused will be abused once people figure out how to do it. And so... The fear is someone could could post a tweet and others could start to retweet it and quote tweet it, kind of, you know, either endorsing it or taking issue with it, but kind of writing their responses. And then that original person could go back and edit the tweet to say something like completely different. So now it looks like all of your followers have endorsed or taken issue with something that's like completely changed in the interim. Um, I don't also quite subscription. understand. Oh, yeah. Also, Sorry. subscription ideas from Elon oh, Musk yes. and not having so subs- advertising. Totally. Um, I think that Elon, so, you know, this proposal is to take the company private. It does look like for Twitter to be private, it might be a little bit easier for the company to play around with 
how it makes its money kind of away from public, you know, the shareholder scrutiny. And so one idea that's been talked about for years is would there be a way for Twitter to add additional additional features that would only be available to users who paid for the service. And for a lot of power users, I think that's like a pretty attractive idea of like, you know, there's different, different, you know, things they might want to see. Like maybe you could set out of office messages for your DMs or different things. Um, it's a little bit, uh, for in current employees of Twitter, that's a little bit causes some of them heartburn because many of the people who've worked for Twitter for a long time really embrace this view of like Twitter being like for the people, like all the people, even people who don't really pay for it. And so it kind of rubs some of them the wrong way. Um, but, but those are some of the, I mean, Elon hasn't shared a ton about his vision for what he would change, but those are some things that people have talked about for years and Elon has endorsed the idea of the edit button. So potentially that's something we'll be seeing. Uh, Brian tweeted, interested to see what ideas Elon Musk has. Twitter allows a certain degree of separation between the people you're talking to. Many of the normal social dynamics you get during an in-person conversation are absent online. And as a result, people can be a lot more forceful online. Uh, also writing, there's some social back and forth that comes from body language that's completely missing online. If I forcefully disagree with someone in person, I get a live reaction of how my opinion impacts them. Online, I'm more or less completely shielded from their reaction. Did you want to respond, Georgia? Yeah, like, so Twitter is over the, since 2018, the company has really talked about ways to make the, the dynamics of conversations like, quote, like healthy or healthier. And so while like they don't have any um, tools or aspects of Twitter that make it easier to kind of mimic some of those social um, cues that keep people kind of more grounded in the humanity of what they're, who they're talking to. They have added things that make it easier for users to report what they view as like harassment um, or hate speech. It doesn't mean the company always gets to those reports in a timely fashion, but there does exist a mechanism and a, a purported way for users to be able to address it. And so I think one question some of the Twitter employees had was what's the future of those types of, um, you know, things within the app or the, the web version under Elon, given kind of he's indicated that it appears that he's much more motivated around this idea of free speech rather than kind of some of the tools that sought to bring more humanity to the space. You said earlier that it's hard to quit Twitter, but I'm thinking a lot of people are wondering, for those who have been banned, like former President Donald Trump, will he be back, Georgia? Yeah, um, certainly um, my colleagues and I have some reporting that the like Elon and people close to him were very animated by Twitter's decision to permanently ban Donald Trump. And, you know, they didn't explicitly say they would bring him back, but they're kind of um, stance at the time was that they extremely very much disagreed with that decision. So a lot of Twitter use, um, many of the Twitter employees I spoke with kind of are kind of prepping themselves mentally for um, that reversal. That's Georgia Wells, tech reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Georgia, thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you, Lucy. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. Coming up, can content moderation and free speech coexist? And what role should federal lawmakers play in this potential Twitter deal with billionaire Elon Musk? We take your questions, too. Join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. How will tech giant Twitter change under billionaire Elon Musk? This is what Musk shared at last night's Met Gala when asked about his plans. The, my, my goal, um, uh, assuming uh, everything gets done, um, would be to make Twitter as uh, inclusive as possible um, and to have as, as broad a swath of, of the country and the rest of the world on Twitter and, and that they find it uh, interesting and entertaining and funny 
um, and that it makes their life better. Mm, it's taken several years for Twitter to come up with comprehensive content moderation to make the platform safer for users. But Musk's idea of free speech may change its course. Can free speech and content moderation coexist? And, and how do you use Twitter today? Or have you deleted the app in recent days? You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Joining us now on Zoom is Joan Donovan, Research Director for the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University. Joan, welcome back to the show. Good to be here. Now, I had mentioned and asked uh, Georgia about uh, the content moderation um, at Twitter in recent years. I'm wondering if you can uh, take us behind the scenes and what has stood out to you since 2018 and some of your concerns now. Yeah, there's uh, there's been a very long evolution of content moderation on Twitter from looking into cyberbullying, into cyber stalking, and then also the harassment of journalists and activists, politicians, and other public figures. And so it's taken a very long time for the rules to evolve into the state that they are now, uh, especially the way in which trolls behave on the platform, which is to say that if you are tweeting about something and it has the characteristics of some public wedge issue, I'm sure this morning people that are tweeting about abortion um, will potentially see some of this behavior where you will see brigades or large groups of people flock over to get someone to shut down their account or get them to go private. Uh, there's also been a lot of doxing on Twitter that is the publication of someone's personal information uh, or phone number and address. And so it's taken a really long time for Twitter, Twitter policies to catch up to what the platform allows, which is to say that it's uh, one of the interesting things that um, Kate Conger's reporting is, has shown us uh, at the New York Times is that even key figures within Twitter are starting to get aggravated that they've built this tool that now Elon Musk and his, uh, as Georgia pointed out, his uh, fans and audience are now using to harass Twitter employees. And so at Twitter, I think when it comes to content moderation, they've learned these lessons and there's no need to roll back the clock. Uh, but it seems like that's where Musk is headed. And it's interesting through the Wall Street Journal reporting as well, when you hear what co-founder Jack Dorsey said back in 2018, I wanted to read this quote. We have witnessed abuse, harassment, troll armies, manipulation through bots and human coordination, misinformation campaigns and increasingly divisive echo chambers. We aren't proud of how people have taken advantage of our service or our inability to address it fast enough. So fast forward now to 2022, as you mentioned, there have been measures uh, to curb uh, some of this, but I'm wondering now when we think about especially disinformation which you research you know you know what we will be seeing on this platform uh, under an elon musk world yeah we're in for a, a really big uh shift politically where if you look at other countries particularly uh philippines or brazil social media has become the center of campaigns and Twitter, of course, most famously has uh, removed Donald Trump's account, uh, has, uh, you know, put the the brakes on some other politicians and has also, um, you know, removed Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, and I don't think that we get where we got with the riot at the Capitol without platforms like Twitter, like Facebook uh, and and YouTube. Because what it allows for is this large networked group of people to share grievances, uh, which can be productive uh, in some cases, but then it also allows them uh, the coordination capacity. And so I think politically, we're going to see uh, more violence at political rallies. We're going to see more um, candidates using the platform of Twitter in particular to get attention and to shift media agendas. And usually you have to do something very outrageous to get attention these days, especially if you're a, a candidate in a small market, uh, which Marjorie Taylor Greene successfully did by posting about QAnon uh, quite frequently. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, in the long run, our politics are going to become highly mediated by platform rules and whatever the platform's especially these very, very large ones, allow 
uh, is going to be reflected in the character and the quality of politicians going forward. You mentioned uh, rules. Uh, rules are not something that uh, Elon Musk follows. And so, uh, you know, why should we believe that uh, there will be uh, particular rules that will be followed and as a, a future uh, Twitter user? And I'm also curious when we think about um, the use of parlor, especially after, uh, you know, accounts being banned after the January 6th insurrection, you know, and, and why when we heard there were so many downloads of that app um, and then what the usage of that um, today is in terms of can we inspect a lot of these uh, people to head back to Twitter, Joan? Well, I think uh, Parler is a bit of a moot point and um, Truth Social hasn't really taken off in the way that they expected it to. And the problem with alt platforms in general is they uh, can be very unstable, they can be very spammy. And we have to think about in context the process by which people even landed at Parler in the first place, which was because main stage Republicans and mainstream right wing reporters promoted the app and said, come over, we'll be here, you'll get some kind of unique experience from this. And then Parler was, uh, uh, along with some other apps, were consequential in the organization of the uh, the Capitol riot. And, and I think Ultimately, those alternative platforms are not going to succeed because they don't offer what Twitter offers, which is actually the main value that Musk was purchasing, which is access to the culture, access to culture makers like journalists and celebrities and and uh, uh, even academics uh, and doctors. And so you don't get that on other platforms uh, in the way that you get that with Twitter. So it wasn't surprised that Musk didn't use his money to build his uh, his own platform or to buy one of these fledgling startup platforms. He wanted uh, what Twitter has built over the last decade, which is um, a highly volatile but influential uh, social network. And so unfortunately, I think it's going to be turned into uh, a weapon in the culture wars even more definitively than it already has. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, as we talk about uh, Twitter under this $44 billion deal uh, for Elon Musk to purchase the platform. Joan Donovan uh, with us now. Uh, when we were talking with Georgia Wells from the Wall Street Journal, and she'd mentioned uh, some of uh, the concerns by uh, Twitter employees. Uh, you shared with the Boston Globe, you know, Musk's desire to make uh, Twitter private probably means a lot of cuts to those who've worked on content moderation. And, and these policies that have been rolled out as Musk sees it, content moderation is a tool for censoring, not customer service. Can you tell us more? Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, other CEOs that have had to deal with content moderation, either on Reddit or um, other large websites with lots of user generated content, they all arrive at the same conclusion. Even Dorsey, who is a very uh, a philosophical thinker about uh, free speech arrives at these same conclusions, which is that uh, people who have access to these new tools use them in incredibly unexpected ways, in ways that are, are frankly, um, you know, dehumanizing. They can be very, very dangerous. And I think that this ties into our our political moment that we're in where the people who are benefiting the most from being able to have uh, their networks activated in this way are uh, main stage politicians, some very large um, key figures that use their accounts to harass uh, journalists and activists. And so I think it's really important that we, we understand that while Twitter isn't perfect, um, it is a process. And what content moderation is, is a process. And so you need a lot of people to be able to do that. And unfortunately, as a customer service, it makes sure that, you know, your feed isn't littered with uh, scams and, and hoaxes and uh, terrible products that are just meant to defraud you. It makes sure that you don't see lots of uh, pornography. If you think back to the days of AOL and how terrible it was to use AOL, <laughs> I mean, uh, email was full of spam. And 
we've gotten to where we've gotten, not by having uh, no rules, but by figuring out each and every technological innovation has the capacity to be turned against the users or the customers of those platforms. And and ultimately, I think when I think deeply about this, that the the main arbiters or the main power brokers in this situation are advertisers because advertisers are the ones that pay the money into the platforms and have the biggest say about what their ads are shown next to. Now, this is confounding with Twitter because Elon Musk said that he doesn't uh, aim to make it profitable. He aims to make it a global public square. And to me, that uh, that means that he's not interested in customer service. Again, you're hearing Joan Donovan, Research Director for the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University. Uh, for another perspective, joining us now on Zoom is Evan Greer, Director of Fight for the Future, a nonprofit digital rights organization uh, that works online to oppose internet censorship legislation. It supports net neutrality and rein in corporate and government surveillance. Evan, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. So let's talk about content moderation under Elon Musk and, and what Fight for the Future is most concerned about. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Joan generally that I think, you know, all we have to go on is Musk's sort of fleeting public comments. And he is so far from being an expert on content moderation or free speech. And so it's hard to know, you know, exactly what he plans to do. But for me, I think that really what this situation does is exposes the broader underlying problem, which is that there are simply too few companies that have too much power over what can be seen and heard and done online. And that's what's putting us in the situation where we have to have an hour long conversation about what Elon Musk might do with Twitter. The only reason that we care about that is because Twitter is so influential, um, as Joan and uh, Georgia outlined. And for me, I think this is just not a problem that can be solved by, uh, you know, pushing for better or more rules on any one of these platforms. What we need is a world where people actually have meaningful choices so that they can find a platform that has content moderation practices and privacy practices that fit their needs. I think even among the folks here on this show, even between me and Joan, we might disagree somewhat on what rules are needed or what type of content should be aggressively moderated. Um, those disagreements are healthy. Um, but again, you know, you wouldn't have the same rules at a dinner party as you have at a big music festival. Um, there is no one size fits all for content moderation. And that's why I think this is a problem that needs to be solved, not by individual choices of I'm going to leave Twitter and go to another platform, but by policymakers. We need policymakers to act, not billionaires, mm -hmm. to get us toward a future where people truly have free expression online. When you bring up uh, policymakers, uh, you know, you're calling for lawmakers to act on antitrust legislation. So uh, tell us more about, uh, you know, what we've heard from Congress and, you know, what needs to be enacted, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, again, you know, I think we can spend forever arguing about what the rules should be on any given platform. And I do think it's really important that we don't allow people like Elon Musk to co-opt the frame of free speech. I consider myself a free speech activist. I think it's crucial that we recognize that people are being silenced and suppressed online. It's just not the folks that Elon Musk likes to talk about. If we actually look at the evidence, it shows that the people who are most deplatformed and silenced on social Social media are not people like Donald Trump and his followers, but rather the people that they like to demonize and attack. It's people of color. It's Arab and Muslim folks who live outside the United States whose speech is regularly suppressed and removed from social media platforms uh, using automated anti-terrorism filters. Um, and to solve that problem, again, what we really need is more control for users. And the way that we get from here to there is not by billionaires buying platforms and changing the rules to their liking, but by policymakers putting in common sense policies that crack down on monopoly power and abusive practices. So two laws that we're looking at right now that I'm optimistic about are the Open App Markets Act and the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Mm 
These are antitrust bills that target only the largest tech companies. So they wouldn't even actually apply to Twitter. They would apply to Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. And they would crack down on some of the self-dealing and anti-competitive practices that those platforms have engaged in, which is part of what has led to this situation where we have such extreme concentration that we have to worry about what the rules are like on a platform like Twitter and and where you know people may be saying in your feed, I'm going to leave. Um, we need a world where they actually have somewhere to go um, and somewhere to go where they can actually build that audience and network effect and still keep in touch with grandma if that's what you're using social media for. Um, and to get from here to there, I think, you know, those antitrust bills are not going to fix everything that's wrong with our tech and media ecosystem, but they would start to put us on a path toward a future where people have meaningful choices um, for social media platforms that work for them and their communities. We reached out to Connecticut's U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal, who's a member of the Senate Commerce Committee. He shared this with us. If consumers had meaningful competition and safeguards for social media, Musk's acquisition of Twitter would not have such, such existential implications. No matter who owns Twitter or any other big tech firm, these powerful companies need to be held accountable to the public and our laws. And it's past time for Congress to pass legislation that sets guardrails and creates accountability for the privacy intrusions, anti-competitive practices, practices and real world harms from these platforms. Uh, Senator Blumenthal says at a minimum, children need protection through the Kids Online Safety Act. Evan, did you want to respond to Senator Blumenthal's statement to us? Sure. So and I would completely agree with Senator Blumenthal that it's past time uh, that Congress acts. Um, but it's important that they act thoughtfully and that they listen to human rights experts as they act. Uh, so Senator Blumenthal is a lead sponsor of the Open App Markets Act, which I just mentioned, which my organization and many others strongly support. Unfortunately, he is also pushing the Kids Online Safety Act, uh, which human rights and child protection experts have argued would actually make uh, many children, particularly marginalized children and LGBTQ youth, less safe, not more safe. He's also a lead sponsor of the Earn It Act, which has been condemned by nearly every human rights organization in the United States, along with major leading LGBTQ rights organizations as a bill that would, uh, again, make children less safe online while also attacking end-to-end -end encryption, which is a technology that uh, keeps human rights activists, journalists, and many others safe. So I think actually, you know, Senator Blumenthal's comments really uh, point us to uh, you know the questions we need to be asking, which is not just you know anything that's bad for big tech must be good, but rather we need thoughtful policies that have been vetted by experts and human rights activists um, to make sure that we crack down on abusive behavior while still enabling uh, online expression. You know, Joan mentioned the way that platforms have been used. Um, you know, to organize. And it's important to recognize that they're being used by the youth climate movement to organize to make sure that we have a livable planet in the future. They will certainly be instrumental as folks push back uh, on what will almost certainly be a wave of horrific uh, crackdowns on people's reproductive health, on LGBTQ rights in states across the country. Um, we need to preserve these tools as powerful organizing tools while cracking down on the surveillance capitalist practices that make them uh, an anathema to human rights around the world. And so it's important that we don't just act, but that we act thoughtfully and, and get the policy right. That's Evan Greer, director of Fight for the Future, a nonprofit digital rights organization. Also with us, Joan Donovan, research director for the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard. We're going to continue talking to them right after the break, including a Musk takeover. Could that contribute to the rise of cryptocurrency? You can also join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking about the future of Twitter and social media in the wake of Elon Musk's deal to buy the social media platform for $44 billion. With us on Zoom, Evan Greer, director of Fight for the Future, a nonprofit digital rights organization, and Joan Donovan, research director for the Shorenstein Center at Harvard. Uh, Joan, I mentioned crypto. You also shared that uh, crypto may find a home on Twitter because of Elon Musk's interest there. Tell us more. 
Yeah, if you think about other reasons why um, Elon Musk might be interested in a huge social network like Twitter is uh, he he's a very interesting character and for years has been uh you know one of the major proponents of of cryptocurrency uh as well jack dorsey uh and twitter shares a very similar interest and of course we had a a flop of facebook's libra uh uh digital currency um when they were also being uh, looked into by the Senate uh, for the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So one of the things that you can imagine Twitter does is it really can normalize uh, a difficult to understand topics or uh, and especially cryptocurrency if it is built directly into the platform, which we've started to see where you can, uh, you know, pay people directly and there was tips for a while. Um, but if it's not necessarily u.s currency but it is cryptocurrency that's being traded on the on the platform you, you might see a, a very quick normalization of it and i think it ties into elon musk's philosophy as someone who is anti-authoritarian um if you really want to uh uh, it, it enrage uh, the state as you would want to come at the economy in a different way and deface the currency. And so um, it might be the case that this catches on uh, very quickly, especially if people are able to move this uh, cryptocurrency quickly through Twitter, use it to pay for, th for real world goods and uh, evade capture by uh, U.S. tax authorities. And so I'm very interested in seeing what other products develop out of uh, Twitter once he uh, finally inks the deal and takes over. And you are also advocating that, you know, lawmakers need to to uh, anticipate that and think about regulation for a future where crypto is an essential component of Twitter. What have we heard so far uh, that uh, maybe that you're inspired by, by uh, certain lawmakers or maybe a little concerned there? Um, yeah, I, you know, when it comes to regulation and, and money, um, Evan is probably a lot smarter than me <laughs> on this when it comes to the digital currency uh, aspects of this. I've I've been in lawmaker offices where they've celebrated cryptocurrency as a, a wave of, of the future and that this is a kind of advancement that they need to understand um, and utilize better. Uh, but I think it'll ultimately be the banking lobbies mm -hmm. that figure out a way to uh, provide some oversight and, uh, you know, create model legislation on this. That's not ideal. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to be really careful about that because uh, crypto portends to be anonymous, but some of the major crypto scandals that we've seen have had to do with it being really difficult to track down massive thefts uh, because of the the way that the currency is designed and and also the way that it is stored. And so, um, hopefully, uh, U.S. Congress uh, will be able to figure this out, but I'd be very interested to know what uh, Evan thinks of this. Evan, you're up. Yeah, happy to jump in here. Um, and, you know, I would say I think Joan's absolutely right. We should be concerned about what it would look like if major tech platforms start directly incorporating either existing cryptocurrencies or start to create their own as, as Facebook kind of famously failed to do. I think to zoom out a little bit though, and, and to, to talk about you know, what policies are needed, it's actually important that we recognize that cryptocurrencies are sort of one small piece of a broader ecosystem of decentralized technologies. Um, you know, blockchains are part of that, but not all of it. Uh, you know, my organization uses a decentralized uh, alternative to Slack called Matrix, uh, which is a decentralized network that's not built on a blockchain. But I think part of why this is relevant and part of why it's so important that we get the policy right around this is while all of the risks that Joan just outlined around cryptocurrencies are absolutely correct. It's also true that I think that we could be in a better world if social media was organized in a more decentralized and interoperable manner. 
So you could imagine social media being more like email, where you can have Gmail or you can choose a more privacy protective service like ProtonMail. But either way, you can email anybody else that has an email address. SMS also works this way. You can have an Android phone or an AT&T phone or a Comcast. I guess Comcast doesn't do phones, but a Verizon phone. But you can text anybody else that has the SMS protocol. Um, you could imagine social media being structured more in a manner like that with kind of nonprofit, transparent governance structures, something maybe like how Wikimedia functions. Um, that's not going to solve all of these problems. It's not going to magically erase things like hate speech and harassment, um, but it could lead to a world where it's harder for bad actors to poison an entire network and where individual users have more control. Um, but if in the process of trying to regulate the bad parts of cryptocurrencies, we kind of bring the entire hammer down on blockchain technologies and decentralized technologies as a whole, we might actually cut ourselves off from that potentially better, more democratized future for technology. And so again, I think it's it's so important. We're kind of in a crisis moment for technology. We're at a fork in the road where we can continue heading in the direction we're heading now, which is you know massively centralized surveillance capitalism as the only business model for the internet. Um, or we could start branching out in other directions, some of which might be worse, some of which might be better. Um, but I think we need to be very, very thoughtful about how we proceed when it comes to policy and regulation. Evan mentioned a crisis point for technology. Joan, uh, what were your thoughts on that in our final minutes of the show? Yeah, I think that uh, ultimately we are in this moment of broad uh, concern about the future of technology, especially communications technologies. If you think about, you know, I'm sure people listening here remember paying long distance fees. And, you know, if you met, uh, you know, uh, someone you're interested in three towns over, you know, you'd have to pay 25 cents a minute to give them a call, right? And and so there are these amazing uh, things that have happened over the last couple of decades of the internet, including low cost connection across the globe and that is something that we should celebrate but also understanding that networks are power and people with huge networks and bad intentions can really cause havoc in the lives of other people and so when we're thinking about well how do we protect free speech we have to think about speech as a social relation especially on social media where your speech is about who reads it or who is connected to it. It's less about what I want to say. Anybody can spin up a website and say everything they want to say. Uh, and I remember the days of blogging when it was, um, you know, notorious to get zero comments, even if you put a lot of work into some some blog post or or uh, artwork. And so I think as we we enter into this moment of very important, important uh, discussion about technology that we don't lose sight of the fact that technology is supposed to be for the people and technology is supposed to be in service to us. And when technology is not in service to us, we have to look at the politics and the economics uh, of the, the technology itself, not just how it functions, but how it serves people uh, in their everyday lives. And when we see politicians and other people using it uh, in order to spread disinformation or to harass uh, others into silence or to call for violence, we have to be attentive to it and we have to understand that uh, these technologies have, have enormous consequences. Joan Donovan, thank you so much. From Harvard and Evan Greer, Director for Fight for the Future, I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Tess Terrible. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>